Digital architecture is an architecture that seeks to minimize the negative environmental impact of building by efficiency and moderation in use of material, energy, development, space, and the ecosystem at large. And by passive sustainable design, it means taking into consideration the effects of sun, wind, direction, vegetation, and all the natural resources which are available on the site uh, for designing a building for heating, cooling, ventilation, um, and let's say lighting, um, or I can put it together uh, for the health and hygiene of the inhabitants. When we say sustainable architecture through passive means, for me, putting it up in a very simple word is designing a building or a space by taking into consideration pancha bhuta, that is five elements, five basic elements of nature, that is space, earth, fire, water, and air. So with that, I wish to invite our national president, Mr. Pankaj Raghaji, to open the session and give his opening remarks. Over to you, Pankaj, sir. Good morning, everyone. And once again, um, welcome to all my international speakers. Uh, we are really delighted to have uh, speakers from across the world and specifically different climate zones from Pakistan, from Nepal, from Vietnam, from Sri Lanka, uh, from Malaysia. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tusharji, for ensuring uh, presence of such eminent speakers today. And thanks to all Rajasthan team for this wonderful start of second day session. Uh, friends, just to update you that the, uh, the GEM program is uh, driven by ASHOCHAM, which has 4,50,000 members. Uh, the ASHOCHAM has taken a green initiative to care of Mother Earth and to complement uh, India, India's sustainability program. Our program is uh, very simple, very it uh, can be downloaded, uh, the guides can be downloaded free of cost. Uh, uh, we are constantly upgrading this to complement uh, the changes which are happening and specifically post-COVID we have, we have, we have to see that the uh, environment is also infection free. So this is that another dimension to the entire certification program. Uh, our program is based on 2017 ECPC National Building Code of India, which are which are, I believe are the wonderful documents. Of uh, we do believe that any certification program does give a payback of less than three to four years, and we all know that the buildings are built for more than uh, 50 years. Uh, we, as GEM, have the, the unique uh, so possibility of monitoring the uh, indoor air quality data the power consumption of the certified building and also the water consumption of the building. Uh, this is something which we want to do and help future uh, architects because unless the data is there, you cannot do research work in this field. And this is what ASHUCHAM is going to give you. And this data will be definitely helpful to other countries also. Uh, we have uh, in place MOUs with several uh, engineering societies like ISHRE, ASHRE, uh, Fire and Security Association of uh, India, IAQL, Smart Habitat Foundation, uh, of course, Indian Institute of Architects, Naratko, and several other societies. In fact, yesterday we did a program with Lighting Society. Our program is getting government recognition. In fact, Rajasthan, uh, the team Rajasthan, this compliment from me uh, again, because they were the first to get Rajasthan government. And also now we are listed by Chrisil. Uh, which is an important uh, uh, organization. And currently, we have been doing projects in all spheres, whether it is pharma industry, electrical giants uh, like Siemens, to universities, to luxury brands of hotels like Hilton and ITC. We did huge number of programs in last uh, eight months, taking full advantage of COVID situation. In fact, the numbers are staggering. You will be glad to know that we, we, we attracted more than 70,000 people uh, during this year, and several seminars. Uh, friends, uh, we have in place a use with 62 universities, and we do believe that uh, uh, should go to the young minds. And you can see in Rajasthan team also, we have several university professors uh, aligned with us. And we, our belief is that unless we educate our youngsters, uh, we are not uh, in safe hands. 
So we want that every building which gets designed in future has to have a green uh, print into it. And our young minds are the future leaders for all of us, whether it is India, Pakistan, Nepal. And this is what we believe that selflessly, this is a prime area where we should be working. Friend, this, uh, this is a seven days uh, ambitious series, first of its kind in India. And you will be delighted that we have 120 plus speakers with 14 plus varieties of subject. And during this period, we will be also launching our new uh, standards for warehousing. This is an area due to post-COVID, due to e-commerce. A lot of investment is going to happen, not only in India, in your part of the country also. So we, we are going to launch this standard on 3rd December. And tomorrow, we are also going to stand, uh, come up with our new standard for healthcare facilities. So uh, thanks to all those leaders who have worked for this. So friends, in this eight months, we did uh, more than 50 webinars, 62 MOU signed, various OMU. So staggering work done by entire uh, leadership. And once again, thanks to Rajasthan team for fantastic work they have been doing. In fact, Tushar is also helping me to go to all the states of the country and also reaching to you. Uh, internationally and have some kind of understanding so that we jointly can learn and take our young, young generation to next stage. So friends, our Prime Minister has a dream to, to make a green and environmental and sustainable country and Ashwacham Jam is working towards it and we thank you very much for your support and you have a wonderful panel. I think it is going to be one of the most interesting panel discussion we are going to have and witness during these seven days and grossing sessions. Thank you so much, Tushaji. Thank you, Gauravji. And thank you, all Rajasthan team. Thank you so much for such a kind word, sir, and uh, for this wonderful opening remark. I won't be taking much of your time, and I don't want to be between the audience and the eminent speakers today we have on the board. So let me introduce them one by one, starting with architect Jen Pereira. Agar Jain Pandra completed his undergraduate and postgraduate education in architecture at the University of Moratuba, Sri Lanka. On completion of his academic career, he was elected as a corporate member of Sri Lanka Indian Institute of Architects and the Royal Institute of British Architects. His professional career has been mainly in the private sector in Sri Lanka and overseas in Nigeria and Oman. He won SLIA Design Award for the Deer Park Resort, Sri Lanka, which subsequently received the prestigious Green Global Award. Jayanta is a founder director of Sri Lanka Green Building Council. I welcome you, sir. Next on board, we have Architect Bibhuti Mansi from Nepal. Architect Bibhuti Mansi graduated from Engineering University, Lahore, in, way back in 1972. He has worked in the Department of Urban Development and Building Construction from 1972 to 79. Later, he started his own architectural firm, Technical Interface, in 1979. He has had training in housing design between 78 and 79 in Japan, with a specialization in green and sustainable building dating. As an achievement, he has participated with his Nepal National Pavilion in world-class expo in Shanghai, China, Milan, Italy, Germany, and current preparing for Dubai. His major projects in tourism sector are Dwarka Hotel, Bhattisputli, Club Himalaya, Nagar Court, Madrid, Swambhu, and extension of Kathmandu Guest House. I welcome you, sir. Next with us is architect Bisma Same Askari. She is a senior associate at Arshad Shahid Abdullah Private Limited one of the Pakistan's oldest and renowned architectural firm. During her 13-year experience, she has worked on projects from north to south, east to west of Pakistan, as well as internationally in UK and UAE. Her passion to impart architectural knowledge and experiences had led her to teach and advise students from different universities on many different occasions. One of the posts taught by her is titled, City Orientation, which creates an awareness of the city and its uncharted areas and students. In 2019, that's last year, she was elected as Honorary Secretary Institute of Architects Pakistan and Chairperson Elect for Arcasia Committee on Young Architects, that is ACYA, all, uh, all while convening IAPEX 
Currently, she has been appointed as convener for IFX 2021 in Karachi. I welcome you, ma'am. Next with us is an architect and doctor, architect Duan from Vietnam. He is a dean, faculty of architecture and engineering, Hong Dong University, Hanoi, Vietnam. He is also a member of executive board Vietnam Institute of Architects. He is member of RTCA Committee on Green and Sustainable Architecture and RTCA Committee on Architectural Education. He is advisor of Vietnam Architectural Journal and also a deputy chair of Foreign Affairs Committee VIA. I welcome you, sir. Last speaker with us for the session is Architect Wawa. She is an architect with strong interest in environment, sustainable design and technology. She has more than 12 years of experience in the advisory on energy and environmentally efficient building. As a result of years of working in national universities of Singapore, as well as local and international architectural firms. She is currently serving as Joint Secretary of Association of Myanmar Architects. She is also a founding member of Myanmar Green Building Society. She has provided the ESD advisory to numerous building developments in both public and private sectors. She has wide experience in performing building performance simulations and analysis having worked on some notable developments such as Changi Airport, Terminal 3, and Garden by the Bay projects in Singapore, and Junction City mixed-use development projects in India. I welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of Association Jam Raisman Chapter. Now, let me introduce you. I know he doesn't need any kind of an introduction. Uh, the moderator of the session today for this session, Ahmed Tushar Sohani. He is principal architect and managing director of this DPL Jaipur. He is chairman elect Indian Institute of Architects Raisman Chapter. He is presently serving as chairman Jam Raisman Chapter and as a Green Dating Initiative. He is convener, uh, he was convener in RTC 11 roundtable meeting that held in 2019 last year. He is zone representative for zone A. Uh, and member representative for India in Architecture Committee, RTCI Committee on Green and Sustainable Architecture. He was co-convener of RTCI Forum 2017, which was an international conference of architects from around 21 Asian countries. He is also vice chair for Sports Committee of Indian School of Architects, an ardent Rotarian, and also a member of Fire Safety and Association of India. So I welcome you. Uh, moderator Ahmed Kushar Sukhani to take this session forward and uh, over to you. Thank you. You have to unmute yourself, Kushar. Yes. Thank you so very much, Gaurav. Thanks a lot. Am I audible now? Okay. So, good morning, uh, all of you from this beautiful city of Pink City, 11.30 here. Time is. I welcome all the eminent speakers. <coughs> Uh, professionals uh, comprising of architects and engineers, green consultants and students for this lovely uh, panel discussions on sustainable architecture through passive majors. And my special thanks to our president, Mr. Pankaj Dharkar, for allowing me to moderate this session, sir. Thanks a lot for your kind inspiration and uh, motivation. Uh, sir, when I was given this task to make this panel, you know, and to carry out this panel discussion, you know, uh, I, I thought that uh, since I have got my good connections with all my friends who are from different climatic zones, you know, so all of these stalwarts who are before us, you know, all they are all are from different climate zones and they are space, specialized in the in the subject. They know about green and sustainability in their own country. So I think it was uh, my pleasure to have all of you in the panel discussion, and I thought that. Uh, when I go to the past, you know, when there were actually no architecture colleges and the architecture in our climatic zones in our country, in Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Vietnam, you know, actually they were sustaining it. What was the reason behind this? There was no architecture college. There was no formal education. So I think people, our ancestors, our forefathers in those times, you know, were actually carrying their regional wisdom, you know, which actually respond to their climatic conditions and their own constraints. So all of us from all the different five countries, we've got a strong legacy 
which I think we should carry with us and try to incorporate in our day design. By this, I does not mean that we should actually forget dynamism. We have to honor this since it is also a part and parcel of our development. We have to think about the new infrastructure. But at the same time, we should not do any blunders, you know, by just going to the active measures of making a sustainable architecture and throwing the passive measures in a garbage bin. Actually, this is not morally and ethically right. So, duty of us architect is very important as far as this particular subject is concerned. We need to actually think, you know, in, well, through the passive measures. And most of the time, you know, I used to think why the term has been given passive measures. It should be actually active measures, you know. <laughs> we always talk that these are the passive measures. So, anyways, I, am, I, I have got many stalwart speakers before me. So before I actually, you know, ask them to present, and we are very delighted to, we are very delighted to hear all of you. But I'll just like to, you know, kickstart the entire discussion presentation so that the people, you know, gel with us. Uh, can I have the presentation right with me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. So sustainable architecture by passive means this is what today we are going to discuss. My uh, screen is visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Thank you. Now, friends, you all know, you know, time has come. We are, all of us are talking about sustainability. And it's a time for actually retaining and reviving ourselves, our environment, not for us, but for our future generation to come. <clears throat> And we all know that you know sustainable development actually comes from the various edges like economics, environment, and social community. And I think in most of our events, last events, we have always discussed about our vernacular wisdom and the contribution of vernacular wisdom to sustainability, actually, which were only basis or on the basis of passive measures. Now I talk about India, friends. We have got five climate zones, you know, hot and dry warm and humid, composite, moderate and cold. And I'm just citing you a few pics, you know, which actually are my old structures, you know. And all of these structures were sustainable, they were actually green in real terms, and they were following the passive measures. You know. And uh, I think uh, we have got all the five zones, you know, western part being hot and dry, central part being composite, first line is warm and humid, like uh, what we have in Sri Lanka, northern part is cool, sometimes, you know, matches few climatic conditions of Nepal also. In some uh, part, of, uh, part of south is the temperature. Now, different climate zones, different buildings, different architecture, different techniques. So all they have got a different, different design language. And this design language not, was not to evolve with a, um, a pre-decided mind. But it was basically a solution to the entire problem of being sustainable. You know? So if uh, in any climate zone they need to have a pitch, door, pitch roof, that means there must have been heavy rains. If I talk about um, um, Jalis and Zarokas, smaller windows, you know, it must be Rajasthan, hot and dry climate. If I talk about northern window where there's a lot of cold, you know, then there must be reason. So you know, these design languages evolve by virtue of their, their presence, their demographic conditions. And I think we have got other speakers who are going to tell about different climate zones. Let's have a look at my climate experience. It is hot and dry climate. You know, we, all, we, we always say, have to think in terms of appropriate shading because I think it's very really imperative to control the solar radiations and the movement of winds here in hot and dry climate like Rajasthan. We need to reduce the exposed area. We need to increase the thermal capacity. And if we see that actually the buildings in our old times, you know, were basically catering to all those things. And you can see a lot of examples from Rajasthan and Gujarat. And let us see some buildings, you know, with the passive measures and with vernacular materials. I think most of you must have seen Havamel, Ajmeri Gate. Havamel, absolutely a blend of local materials, small small cooking. And in fact, if you stand on the other side of the Havamel, you will really feel as if you're standing before a chiller plant, you know, where it is swaying your natural air like anything. Ajmeri gate usage of 
very eco friendly materials local material and moreover city palace of jaipur you know absolutely planned in the year 1726 absolutely as per the climatic conditions and it is sustained today also you know, even if you go to the uh, habitable spaces of city palace you actually virtually do not need any air conditioning in the ambient temperature of 42 degrees so this was the essence you know amir fort i think most of you must have seen bazaar of jaipur you know it will be in local material proper you know sharing devices was given and moreover the bawdis the stuffs of rajasthan they know at that period of time that they need to you know um, conserve the water the rain water water harvest the rain water i think this is what we or as the said that there were a lot of courtyard planning see how a courtyard amidst the you know, habitable spaces you know gives you a cooler air and finally your all spaces become cooler so courtyard planning was one design principles which evolved at that period of time for hot and dry climate you know. if we talk about some arabian countries you know, they have got a vault uh, design because of certain reasons which give them a good air locking and you know hot air always stuck in a pocket you know and there was a there, there was a design principle which evolved in the climate of rajasthan they used to have a small small water body uh, in the koti area you know, where they used the technology of evaporative cooling so this is how we work today we are digging it but we are at the same time we are doing a lot of gadgets we are using actor mills also and those people were so sensible they were so witty that they used all their regional wisdom that time wind towers we have seen that how wind towers actually work in different part of the world you know. the one of the best example of passive design the most important part is at top of the rajasthan are the beautiful jalis they 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 have given this jalis because there is a proper it was a it was a design generated in rajasthan it was a filtration of air you know the same time it actually by default added to the aesthetic values of any building zero cars were there always there were shutter windows you know my ancestor when i saw my haveli and my bell structure in rajasthan they know i know they were shutter windows there was a reason behind it that if i give a big window i'll have more of the transfer so just in order to get a cooler breeze by a hot ambient of 42 degree finally it turns into 28 degree this was the beauty you know of their design principle and if if we see that there were there used to be a ventilator there was a reason behind it that hot air always rises up and hot air moves out of your ventilators so there were always just below the ceiling level there were ventilators logic there was a logic behind everything you know. let us understand this building you know they actually did the shape in the proportion they actually used the jali where it was a in air filtration kind of a stuff they actually used small openings this is what was happening for the pursi tree and the buildings of uh, shikhavati regions of pakistan and the always they used to make thick paper walls so that you know transmission of heat is less you get a pr- proper insulation and and many structures they have used cavity walls also so i think passive measures of doing architecture is actually really very very, very cost efficient and actually practical friends i think we need to uh, uh, take this design principles from our legacy and try to incorporate in our present day design so this is what we are going to talk in today's topic we've got a lot of eminent speakers you know who basically specialize as actually on the subject so uh, and uh, one of the most uh, fantastic speaker who have i have always admired you know and i have taken him uh, like my mentor you know uh, 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 for green and sustainable architecture committee uh, agesia because jayanta was one of the person who always inspired me for getting into this green committee so i would re- I, and i always love to hear from him because you know uh, he comes from a climatic zone and he always thinks of a proper solution so again i'm delighted that today i got uh, architect jayanta parera with me and uh, over to you jayanta everyone in india you know is so desperate to uh, listen to your presentation because you know that what what contribution you have given to the sri lankan community of uh, architects you know so over to you jayanta so let us start our panel discussion our first speaker will be jayanta 
Thank you to thank you very much. much. Thank I, you. Uh, share my uh, yes. Let me just share my. Can you all see my slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. I just want to start the start my talk. I must uh, congratulations for SJM celebrating 100 years this year. And my thanks to Mr. Pankaj, Chairman of SJM, Mr. Niranjan, Ms., uh, Dr. Niranjan, sorry, Mr. Viran, uh, Vina, Vineet Agrawal, and Mr. Deepak Sood. And not to mention, not my dear friend. Tusha from Rajasthan. And I'm honored to be speaking at this first ever event organized in India on the subject of sustainability, reality and sustainability conference, conference award ceremony and Expo 2020. And today's event is organized by the GEM Rajasthan chapter and thank you so much and I'm honored to be a speaker today. So I'm going to talk talk to you about sustainable architecture by passive means. Sir, can you adjust your camera, sir? Please, sir. Unmute my camera. No, no, no. Adjust your camera. Adjust my camera. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Am I okay? Sir, we want to see your full face. Your face is just getting cut. Let me see. Are you using a webcam or something like that? Because yeah, yeah, now it's okay. Now it's okay. Now it's okay, right? Sir. Yeah, also. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. What is sustainable architecture? An approach to building that minimizes <laughs> human health and the environment. The green architect or the designer attempts to safeguard air, water, and earth by choosing eco-friendly building materials and construction practices. Passive design. Design that takes into consideration the effect of, effect of sunlight, wind, vegetation, and other natural resources occurring on the site when designing the buildings, hearing, heating, cooling, lighting, and ventilation systems. Application of sustainable architecture by passive means. You need to consider building orientation, which is very, very important. Building skin, what material that you use on the building skin, roof structure, what, what shape, what direction, so and so forth. Then the windows, how you place the windows, then the construction material that you use, energy efficiency, water saving initiatives, and the use of landscape in and around the buildings. Building orientation, south facing orientation, exposing the building to natural lighting and solar radiation in order to gain sufficient daylight. Now the south facing, uh, the, the facing of the orientation of building depends on the climate that you are in. You see, if you are in a temperate climate, you will want to get the maximum uh, sunlight uh, solar into your building. In the other hand, on a temperate climate, or a, sorry, tropical climate like ours, or tropical climate like Sri Lanka, where the uh, humidity is very high, and the temperatures or the sun uh, temperature is very high. Again, you see one of the most uh, I think uh, it has been found that Sri Lanka has the most a, thick, uh, a very uh, uh, what you call unique climate which says at 35 or 40 degrees centigrade temperature, we have 95% humidity. So it's a very difficult, difficult. So we, in the tropical climate like ours, we make sure that the buildings are oriented, the short or the blank walls are facing east-west and 
all the openings are facing north south so so these are the issues that we come to building orientation minimize the habitat, habitat destruction that's of course a thing for everywhere volume to surface ratio this is another issue how much surface that you expose into the climate based on your volume of the building reducing heat loss and energy load by organizing spaces in concentrated arrangements to minimize surface area sun shading forms lean back towards the sun that the door steps inwards from top to bottom this of course applies to uh, multi story buildings and so on and so forth then the ventilation path arranging multiple masses with opening spaces between them in order to improve the microclimate or temperature controlled by in into inducing breeze and ventilation in interior spaces so this is what even uh, susha was explaining the fact effect the courtyard how you in induce the uh, uh, fresh air to get into the building and how you introduce the hot air to rise up and get out of the building maximum natural thermal content short side of the building is on the east west axis and minimize the heat solar loads maximize the views is all although we don't talk about this views are an important aspect in buildings because people who are living inside they need to see to see outside so to see outside you need to locate your windows in the right place and looking at the right things so building skin <clears throat> it induces the double skin induces the greenhouse effect in winter while producing natural ventilation in summer with two skins of separate double glazing now this is applicable for temperate climates translucent skin sunlight controlling system that works by attaching a perforated plate or translucent wall into the building skin producing a design that forms a translucent and uniform <coughs> skin overlap with openings in on the surface <coughs> this was very very much highlighted in tushar's uh, slides where he showed the jalis of the uh, rajasthan buildings blue and sunscreen again this is about that sunscreen system that forms a repetitive pattern creating a unified image of the facade closed facade minimize the number of external openings prevent heat loss in winter in response to its cold climate while natural ventilation and day lighting are induced by placing the placing an atrium in the center section of the building now this also applicable mainly for uh, temperate climates roof structure main area subject to the high level of exposure and deal with the heat transition so this is a very important aspect in building design especially the low rise buildings where the roof structure which is exposed continuously to the natural environment and therefore how to reduce the solar uh, heat getting into the building so we have methods of green roofs uh, reflecting roofs and so on and so forth amount of heat produced and retained by roof can be transferred to the building cause warmer built environment which uses a lot of energy to cool roof structure continue raised roofs where this is what matters which when you have courtyards and raised roofs where you have the stack effect where the uh, natural ventilation we get into the building through the courtyard and then rises up and gets out of the building using a roofing material that has a high reflectivity of solar radiation creating a natural environment on the roof green uh, green roofs and green gardens some of the pictures i'm uh, portraying is if you can see the picture on the left is from the famous architect jeffrey bawas kandela hotel windows south side need to maximize light gain should have the high solar gain coefficient east and west side should have lower coefficient as there is high heat level multiple pane low heat coating reduce long wave reduction radiation heat transfer 
maximize natural ventilation. Construction material use of all buildings, recycle architecture salvage, salvage building material, bricks, stone, timber, and roof tiles, salvage doors, windows with frames. These are retrofitting buildings and using recycled material in the new building, which is again a passive means without uh, using new energy, right? Uh, by using new materials, salvage those windows with frames. Responsibility, harvested wood, locally harvested material, bamboo, mud, and clay. In our region of the world, we use, we can use these materials, which are very passive, uh, sustainable materials, which are, which can relate to architecture by passive means. Non-synthetic and non-toxic materials, obviously. In Energy saving and management, daylight and ventilation, atrium, sorry, light and daylight ceilings, ventilation duct and ventilation power, daylight duct, skylight and monitor. These are some elements that we can use in buildings to save energy and use passive energy in buildings to reduce the use of artificial energy being used in buildings. Use CFL, lead energy saving features. You see appliances with better energy rating systems. So these are the things that we have to use in the new context, new uh, world where energy saving materials are available, like even the toilet accessories where they have sensor uh, operated uh, taps and so forth. This all low flow faucets. As I said, shower heads as well as ultra low and dual flush toilet, which saves water, which is again a very, very important material or uh, ingredient that we, we are getting short of in this world. High efficiency washing machines and dishwashers, reusing rainwater and water plants. Use rainwater and recycle gray water for use of toilets instead of using potable water. Now, this I, I can give you an example in um, new cities or new development, new uh, neighborhoods in countries like Australia. They have a two-pipe system where the portable water is used only for drinking purpose and cooking and so forth. And they have a second pipe, recycled water, which are used for wash, uh, washing, uh, gardening, uh, washing of cars and things like that. And the price of the two waters the, is about five times the, the, the five times costly, the portable water than the recycled water. Landscape. Wall gardens, green walls, hanging gardens, reduce non-filtration paving and use glass paving. Rooftop garden, green roofs, portable vegetation, regrow for use minimal footprint for the building less cut and fill site water space. Now, this is again, when you are designing a building in a site, these are the ingredients that you must consider if you are going to do a building which is going to use passive means instead of using more artificial means. Now, this is a slide that shows different types of building. Again, the top right hand building is the famous Jimbawa's uh, Kandalama Hotel, where it's now in the daytime, you don't even see a building. It's from, if you go to the other side of the lake and look at it, you don't see a building. Some others are from our climate. And uh, this first building is a building that uh, won a platinum award in Sri Lanka, the highest building greenery on it. So that's all about uh, my uh, talk about sustainable architecture by passive means. And thank you very much for me inviting me again. Over to you, Tusha. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Janta. I think it was a really nice insight of uh, you know, uh, passive measures. And it's very nice that you took us to the present era and you, what we learned uh, from uh, what lessons we learn from our ancestors, you know, 
how we can incorporate corporate in our this modern demand i think that was fantastic i think our session is absolutely now on we are actually putting in tune you know, and i showed about the basic design principles which our ancestors used to follow jenta showed how that those can be incorporated in present day design fantastic thank you so very much for such a nice presentation jenta thank so you thank you thank you jenta now our next speaker is a very renowned figure and uh, the architect vibhuti man singh who was past president sona and uh, he is the chairman for sustainable committee of nepal also actually i have heard him you know few times you know i have really heard him that he is a honor to our legacy you know which has been provided to us by our mother earth we are desperate to hear from you sir so over to you mr man Uh, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Yes. Ah, yes. You yes. are. You muted me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Pankaj and Mr. Tushar. I I guess this is the second time that we met. We met earlier also online and. that time i think we exchanged notes on donald trump <laughs> and we meet on a happy note today because we are all are happy about his defeat he was someone that had to be pushed out so just four words for him good riddance of bad rubbish <laughs> okay so much for donald trump and i thank your associate mr neeraj arora also for his very successful uh rehearsal session the other day and his associate i forget his name with whom i had some tense moments trying to get get my head around the share screen function you must have thought hi ram what buddhe mil gaya <laughs> ah so okay that's that's it thank you thank you all thanks thanks for all the all the participants as well we exchange notes with a couple of people but first i feel that i have to sing a praise for india itself india you know the very idea of india a land of incredible diversity and a thousand inspirations i say india you know we grew up being enraptured by your popular culture your popular culture especially the movies and songs my god the songs kishore kumar lata mangeshkar Mohammad Rafi, Asha Bhosle, and lately Shreya Bhos, Shreya Kosal, and uh, Arijit Singh. My God, Namaskar to all of them. The songs, my God, we are enraptured. We may be a different political entity, but our socio-cultural mix is the same. The whole subcontinent. We simply love your songs and look at. Look at Amir Khan, my God, and my childhood hero Sanjeev Kumar. Allow me to indulge in my fantasies for a moment, and look at the uh, look at Guljar, my God, and his creation, my all-time favorite, that movie, Rudali. I don't know how many times I have seen that movie, the song, the story, the great story by Mahashweta Devi. Wow! Namaskar to all of them. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, can I? Can I? Where's my? I where's think you have got the presenter right with you, sir. You can share the. Uh, you can share the screen. Oh yeah. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got it now. I got it. This is sustainable architecture by passive means. Okay. I have to congratulate the person who suggested this topic also, you know, sustainable architecture by passive means. Wow. That's a very unique topic, a very unique perspective on, the, on a very important topic. Now, my passive means, can I go to, yeah, so first, we'll have to go to, go to definitions first, sustainable, I understand it to mean that which endures, that which survives and lives on, and passive means an attribute, a property, a quality that is embedded pre-existing, intrinsic, without any external inputs. We are talking virtually about natural beauty without any cosmetic treatment. That's what passive means for me. Sustainable architecture by passive means. So when we say that, you know, uh, by the way, our uh, green design guideline that SONA is working on, Completely half of that guideline is dedicated to passive means alone. Half of it is dedicated to active means, of course. And when you say passive with no external inputs, pre-existing, intrinsic, it means that that has to be incorporated at the conceptual design stage. And passive means no external inputs, no external inputs at all. Now, now when I'm sure all the speakers, they would focus on the physical aspects only of architecture, I submit that that's only part of the experience, so I say that we have to delve into the realms of consciousness, which consists of three major aspects. That's the physical, then the mental, and the emotional. You see the Venn diagram over there? Physical, mental, emotional, which together make up the spiritual aspect of architecture. Now, I don't wish to bore people by delving on the physical aspect alone. Architect Giant Pereira focused on the physical aspect also only, which is a very relevant concern, of course, but I choose to focus on the mental and the emotional aspects of architecture only, which means that what makes architecture mentally and emotionally appealing? What makes their mental and emotional appeal last for centuries on end. So for that, we have to go into the very philosophy, the very psychology, the very psychoanalysis and literature itself. And I submit that for that, you have to go into what I call the archetypes archetypes of basic architectural forms. Archetypes is a term devised by that famous psychoanalysis analysis, analyst, Carl Gustav Jung, which you know about. So among the archetypes, there are many archetypes. My favorites are the circle, the square, the triangle, and the spiral. These, the use of these basic geometric shapes have ensured enduring emotional and mental appeal to buildings. And my all-time favorites in the use of archetypes in architecture, you know, the top one is the complex, the capital complex in Dhaka, and the bottom one is from India itself, 
by that greatest of Indian architects, Charles Correa. The top one is by uh, Khan, of course, Louis Khan. The bottom is by Charles Correa. And he passed away recently, of course, and uh, why the Pritzker Prize eluded Mr. Korea can be the topic of a separate discussion, so let's move on. And other archetypes in architecture is the triangle or the pyramid. You know, we are very familiar with these images, the Sydney Opera House and the Louvre, and the Louvre Pyramid by IMP. Sydney Opera House also, they are very well written. And spirals in architecture, that's also a very powerful archetype. That's the Guggenheim by Frank Lloyd Wright and the use of spirals in spare staircases, that's in the Vatican. And spirals in the spirals and circles, in, they are very these archetypes are very scalable. You know, you can be used at any scale, whether it is the site plan scale or the interior design scale. They are very, very scalable. And the use of these archetypes ensures that they are mentally and emotionally enduring. Now, these two images, the left one is from your own Oroville, and the right one is from Nepal. This is by Kenzo Tange. It's the master plan for the Lumbini development project. Look at the use of his spiral and squares and all those archetypes. Now, the other method that I choose to focus on is from literature itself, it's metaphors. And four of my favorite metaphors are lamp and the candle, the umbrella, the niche, and the flower. You can see the use of these metaphors in architecture, like this. Metaphors in architecture, lamp and the candle. This is a building in China. And the use of an umbrella in architecture, this is from Singapore. And the famous nest, bird's nest, this is a stadium in China, and the use of niches in architecture. Just look at them. Their enduring appeal, their enduring attraction to the human mind. It, it resonates with something within us. That's what I want to focus on today. And the flower. The very form of the flower when used as an external shape itself in architecture. The Lotus Temple that's in New Delhi. And this right one on the right one is a stadium that's going on in China, both in the shape of a flower. Now, some of the archetypes in architecture that I have used in some of my projects just a minute, is uh, I have just taken three of them. I've used the circle and the square. That's a, a pilgrim accommodation, the image on the left, pilgrim accommodation in Lumbini itself, which, by the way, has been bankrolled by Sri Lanka. You know, it was built by Sri Lanka. It was paid for by Sri Lanka. It's in Lumbini. And the two images on the right are from our national pavilions in China and Germany. The bottom one is in Germany. The use of squares and circles and spirals in the building form itself, they are archetypes. Now, I'll leave you with tips for further research on archetypes and metaphors. The first one is phosphines. I don't know whether you have heard about it, but these phosphines are what exists inside us, inside our brains. Phosphines are produced when you press your eyeballs, you know, when you press your eyeballs and or when you bang your head against something, 
you see these stars, and these stars can be <clears throat> can be broken down into these fifteen basic shapes. Of course, there are many other star-shaped patterns that you see when you bang your head or when you press your eyeballs. These are something which can be used for architecture. They are very much scalable. They can be used at any scales. And of course, the next subject is neuroscience. That's the figure of a brain with the eye of Horus from Egyptian mythology. It, you know, approximates the location of a part of the brain, which is called the amygdala, which is responsible, responsible for our mental and emotional reactions to stimuli. And this is a very, very interesting subject that people might want to research. And the third one is biophilia, taking inspiration from nature. And we have a very strong chapter in our green design guideline, which is being developed by SONA. In fact, there are five major chapters on biophilia. These are tips for further research for those who are interested. Now, I leave you with two quotes from literature, which says the ultimate archetype is death itself, then the ultimate metaphor is life. And for death, there's a very famous line which says, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. My, the first time I read these lines, I felt like I was struck by lightning. The second quote, do not go send gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. It says, fight, fight, fight against death. The dying of the light is a very strong metaphor for death itself. It says, fight, fight against death itself. And you know how we can do the fighting? We can do it by architecture. Fight, fight against death by architecture, which is the mother of all arts. And I must say, it is the best profession in the whole world. Thank you. Thank you to all the rest of the listeners. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for such a nice spiritual presentation. You know, I will not tell in this. It was a very nice spiritual architectural presentation for the first time in the history of architecture. Thank you so very much. So I think you very well correlated the things and it was almost you just took us to the new dimensions of architecture, which actually we were doing it, but you just taught us how to coordinate. Thank you so very much, sir. Thanks a lot. Now, over to one of my very dear friend, architect Bisma, a young and energetic architect from Pakistan, you know. So, Bisma, over to you. People will really like to listen from you because you guys also are rich, like our country, in you know, a lot of structures which actually follow the passive measures, you know. So over to you, Prisma. Thank you, Tushar. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, um, Afshan, for inviting me. Thank you, Tushar, specifically, for inviting me for this session. Uh, President Sankaraj, thank you for having me. And um, all my fellow speakers. Is my voice clear? Sorry, I can just hear a uh, talk back. Tushar, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. It's just a little disturbance, maybe because of Okay, is that better now? No, better. No, better. Yeah, better. And of course, thank you, Gaurav, uh, Master of Ceremonies, uh, for, you know, running this whole show, and Tushar, uh, all of you. And uh, hope uh, I can speak to you, like, about a, a sustainable architecture by passive means. Uh, it will be a pictorial presentation. Since Pakistan and India are very similar, uh, and obviously sister countries, there are many similarities, many differences, uh, but not too many. Uh, we were one country at one point, 
and uh, our hearts still belong to each other and hopefully uh, we share a lot in history in traditions in culture and of course in friendship so that will never change despite the boundaries that are created through politics and everything uh, but yes so sustainable architecture by passive means um as you all know sustainable architecture is for me sustainable architecture means something that can be sustained uh something that withstands time withstands situations uh and gives back to people in ways uh and by passive means this is the these are the natural elements that come into play while designing architecture for the people um how these uh, elements are are put into play and uh, and used is what i will be talking about pakistan like india uh, is a country with varied landscape and varied uh, climate climatic conditions uh, we have mountains in the north the south is a fair, has a coast the region sea but of course it also does have the desert towards the east we have punjab where where our country is meet up and of course towards the west uh, we have um, again mountainous ranges etc so the situation is very similar to india the climatic conditions are very similar to india and of course traditions are also very similar to india uh, so you all can relate to them very easily uh now this is the architecture of the landscape when you look at the architecture in the north it always is something that is part of the landscape cut into the landscape carved into the landscape made from the landscape used uh, materiality plays a major part in uh, all of this materiality in the north is fairly different to that in the south materiality is very different from the east to the west as well uh, and how spaces are carved out and used by people that also gets impacted again if you see this um it's part of the mountainous range made from stone um has fairly, fairly smaller windows and fairly smaller openings because this area of the country gets fairly cold where temperatures drop down to minus 10 and lower architecture of the south this is where the the part of the country where i'm a part uh, where i am and we have the arabian sea over here but the the uh, architecture of this region dates back much before that uh, where you have mohenjo-daro the in, and the indus valley civilization which is known for its uh, architecture and and its actually its uh, water and plumbing systems at that time uh, where stone and bricks were used so in this region we end up using a lot more stone stone fired bricks and uh, obviously to keep the um, structures cooler we also have mud architecture the punjab uh, which is the east it has a lot of bricks uh, used over there as well again because of the climate to keep it cool uh, and different elements come into play with that uh, balochistan which is the west is where you have again a lot of mountainous ranges but the climate over here is much harsher it will be much warmer uh when it's summer and then much colder when it's uh, winter so over here you have a different form of architecture where you have this cave architecture which is carved out again into the landscape and as you can see this house which has a, a courtyard within the uh, mountainous range and of course mud architecture is also used over here now for this for passive means to come into play into sustainable architecture there are certain elements within the subcontinent that come into play both in india and pakistan this is very similar again we have the sehen what we call the sehen and you all may call the angan is courtyard uh, the veranda or uh, the veranda or uh, in called in english which is usually a porch which actually pushes back the the main structure of um, the main structure uh giving it a little more space to step away from the heat uh and allowing different uh experience experiential spaces happening over there the jali which is basically a brisele uh, um a screen which prevents from the heat and uh what we also have is called the badgeer which is the wind catcher 
these again are used towards the south. Both the Jali and the uh, the Badir are used towards the south of the country. Um, and also, yeah, the the Jali is also used towards the Punjab side as well. So these are elements that come into play when designing architecture within Pakistan, given the climatic conditions, uh, the sustainable architectural elements, and the and by means of being passive. Now, looking at current day implementation, what is um, sustainable architecture? It is what uh, history has left us. It is what culture gives us. And it is something that we need to hold on for the future. Yes, we were colonized and we all decided to ape the West in, in, in this whole process where we thought that the British rule uh, gave, gave us a lot more. And we always look towards the British to guide us in all of our uh, directives in every way, but there is a time where we have to hold on to our own culture, our own traditions, and bring them forward within architecture. So um, these are some projects that I'm just going to show you. These are very current and modern projects by friends and colleagues of mine, and some projects that um, my office has also done. Um, this is a house, which is a three-unit family house uh, designed on three levels. Um, designed by a very uh, young architectural firm called Coley's Design Studio. And again, you can see the concept of the courtyard, the screen, the jali, they all come in. Yet you have ventilation, sunlight, all of these things come into play and, and play an important role in this type of architecture. Again, this house uh, towards the right by a AEDL, it's, towards the, uh, it's in Punjab. And uh, again, you can see the materiality used in designing this house. It, it, there's a lot of brick usage over here, uh, whereas, again, you have the introduction of the courtyard as well. Current day implementation, which still includes old methods and mechanisms, where people are still making mud brick, uh, bricks, uh, mud bricks, and, and like mud is being used for insulation, bamboo is being used, natural materials are being used, to um, basically give better spaces and healthier spaces to people, which bring in the natural elements of day-to-day -day life. These are projects, that are resettling in, this is a project done by architect Heather, whereas uh, barefoot, so, barefoot Social Architecture is done by Madam Yasin Lari. Uh, it is a project that she has been doing for a very long time and is very near and close to her. Another uh, house that I would like to, a project that I would like to introduce you to is uh, this bamboo house. Now this, uh, people would assume bamboo is something that is usually used in low income settlements, but no, not necessarily. Um, over here, it is being used for a client where bamboo has taken over the whole house and it, is, and it made it a very cost effective house and a very green house in that sense where there is minimum use of a brick and um, uh, and concrete where needed. Uh, and then the major elements and the screening and the jollies and the, and the, uh, have been done by bamboo. A lot of green elements have been also introduced. The whole house on one side has been covered with bamboo, whereas the other side is completely co covered with green. Again, the courtyard element is there and uh, it comes into play. This is a fairly large project. It's called the Teleno um, Building. It's in Islamabad. It's designed by ARCOP. And uh, what has been used here is the, uh, the implementation of uh, rammed earth. Um, and again, around a courtyard system of design. Uh, it is an office building, and there has been glass used. But again, there are elements that come into play, uh, which make it again passive, uh, make it sustainably, um, sustainable architecture by passive means. Uh, the, the rammed earth, the screen, the, the courtyard, the water pool, again, giving all the, um, you know, cutting down heat and all of those things. This is an urban school uh, in, made in Punjab. Uh, again, mud brick architecture with a lot of bamboo used over here. It's a, it's a low-income school, but this is um, 
it is something that is commonly used in this part in this in our country where you have a combination of mud and bamboo coming in together uh the Afghan university hospital in karachi which is the southern part of the country where i am actually right now is a great example of a uh, sustainable architecture to passive means uh why i say this is because it involves and incorporate every mean of every mean that i had previously discussed whether it's courtyards whether it's um you know jalis whether it's uh, uh whether it's a veranda system whether it's uh, wind catchers all of these have been incorporated in this hospital design a lot of foliage has been used a lot of greenery has been added uh, again water bodies a uh, courtyard elements all of these things come into play and it doesn't even feel like a hospital to tell you the truth it actually gives you uh, that feeling of spirituality and calmness that devuti sir was talking about this is when architecture goes beyond just being a building and giving you peace and tranquility that too in your times of trouble you can see again how all of the elements of passive means come into play with with natural elements coming into the building and people experiencing them but not making it difficult for them again the wind catchers the screen uh the the push back of the entrances they all play a part in all of this i'm trying to keep this very short and sweet because i know we've been running over again water bodies have been incorporated uh over here as well because this part of the country like mumbai is very hot and and very dry and and its humidity levels really rise over here so all of these elements do come into play uh during this now um this these are some projects that uh, that have been done by the office that i work for the design studio that i work for again uh this is a low income hospital mushan hospital uh but the introduction of simple design elements where you can see uh um you know the natural ventilation happening sunlight coming in you can see birds sitting in these uh um, in in the ceiling as well uh it's a courtyard system again giving nature its importance making it part of the building making it part of the experience for people again a uh, very you know it's a screen wall as well as the thickness of this wall in front of the building is much thicker allowing again that heat production and all of that to happen the curvature of the building again plays an important role in all of this and um yes yeah. foliage greenery plantation in all our designs do play an important role as we are part of nature we do come from nature and we do return to nature so implementation of uh, incorporating uh, nature into our designs is very important for sustainability for holding on to our traditions and um, you know basically being uh, passive uh, basically uh, designing with passive means again another house courtyard again very important uh the green be again coming into play all of these things play an important role not only in sustainable architecture but also in our health and well-being especially nowadays in covid where we've all been experiencing being at home working from home when we design our spaces all of these things need to come into uh, our thinking uh for example how are we going to be in the future uh how are we going to be sustainably viable uh how is the architecture going to be sustainable sustainably viable and how are the natural elements going to um you know take that forward for us we need to think as designers hence we need to go back to our roots and our traditions hold on to them and and design with them in the future thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you very much bisma for the tonight in sight of the pakistan i know uh, politically speaking it's very difficult to get the visa but i think you are very much physical person there i I've, i've thankfully had good luck with that and i've come across a number of times that's really great we also look forward to the same next time you have to come by definitely thank you so very much you know
Thank you so much, Tushar. Thanks, uh, thanks for your nice presentation. Now, I am switching on uh, to my another dear friend from Vietnam, you know, who has been a very, always a multi faceted guy, you know. He represents Vietnam in a lot of committees. I've seen him in the education committee. I've seen him since long in uh, architectural sustainability, green and sustainable committee. So uh, over to you, Tran, for your nice uh, question, you know. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Tusha. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Asu Cham and my friend Tusha for inviting me to be a speaker at this conference. So today I would like to present about the topic. Uh, about topic, uh, today I would like to present about the topic vernacular in the new expressions of architecture. As you know, uh, my presentation will deliver three issues. The first is vernacular wisdom applied in traditional architecture in Vietnam and in Asia. And the second is sustainable designs based on local experiences. And the last is future of the new vernacular architecture. So you know that uh, the glob globalization now is increasingly, and uh, we know that adopting the culture through architectural duplication is happened everywhere in the world. So technology made duplication of the same identifiable architecture building cities and make us uh, share the, some, some very common commons, the city, the building, and the architecture style across the world. So you know that now 43.8% uh, 40, uh, of the global population is now living in the rural. And that means that more than half live in the city so year by year, this number is increasingly. And we have questions for answering. How many resources do we spend for 1% road? You know that can we, can modern technology solve everything we face in the world today? First thing, I think that Technology is not cheap, it's expensive, and it is claimed an overall application process, and the process time is long, and it's very difficult to suit countries that are not rich. For example, in Vietnam, we are a developing country, so we have to choose which technology we can apply and which we can wait for the future. So we have a question that, are we developing really sustainability? We're turning back to the past and we think that we should promoting wisdom from local experiences. And we should think about the vernacular. From vernacular, we think that it's architecture, it's our common ideals, it's languages, it's native, it's neutral by generation to generation. It's the values which we can earn from the past, which adapt for the climate, for the natural, for the surround environment, for the theoretic. And we learn and we inherit from our ancestor. And this should be circulation from generation to generation, and is aesthetic. So the first, I talk about the vernacular wisdom applied in traditional architecture in Vietnam and in Asia. For vernacular, we should think about three issues. The first is climate. The climate is, is the main factor that generates the design. The second is material and skill. The material from nature can be recycled and skill applied continuously improve 
and optimizing from generation to generation. So it's perfectly uh, by generation to generation. So it will will adapt and it meets the demand of the generation. For the culture and lifestyle, I think that culture is create the identity for each community, for each country, and for each local city or local village. And lifestyle, shape the architecture style and the urban activity. So for the Asia city, I think the urban activity is very important because it's very, we, are very, we have a rich culture and our local activity made the city have identity. So for the past, vernacular architecture in Asia is very green, especially in the tropical climates like uh, Southeast Asia. And the relationship between people and the environment is very harmonious. And vernacular wisdom is accumulated in which quality experiences pass on, continuously edited and perfected from generation to generation. And geography and landscape are rationally exploited, which for we can build not only a house, but, but also a village or a very a high uh, density in the city, which we meet the geography and landscape. And the shape and local materials and sustainability to the climate and the residential spaces are considered as an independent ecological unit like a, a house in the rural area. So the, the owner of the house, they do not go out for many days because they have everything inside the house, the local food, the vegetable, and it not make any harms to the environment. The ease of the house cover the sun, rain, raising dust, and creating a cover of a living spirit in our traditional houses. And uh, for sunshade, what create an air cushion and be mobile is to catch the wind, block the sun, and create a legally bucket in traditional houses in the rural area of Vietnam. So in Asia, when I compare, compare it to uh, temple, the left is a very famous temple in the north of Vietnam, and the right is a temple in Japan. So we can see, if you compare the form, the floor lifting at the column system between Vietnamese communal house and Japanese traditional indoor. So we, we can see that it has something similar or some, share some structure system. And if we can see, we can compare the Max house in Malaysia and in the north of Vietnam. Uh, and we can see they can share the same material and the same ways to go to build the house. Or we can compare the trip house in Penang, Malaysia, and in Hanoi, Vietnam, in the right. And you can see that it's built and renovated year by year. And if it shares the same shape uh, of creating an indoor courtyard and the shape of the space inside, the mix between uh, the shop and the house. So the second, I talk about the sustainable design based on local experiences. In the modern time, vernacular architecture always respect and emphasize the harmony. The new design trends combine modern and vernacular in Vietnam. We took place in, took place in 1960, decade. And this trend was started and named modern tropicalized architecture. So we can see in the designs of the University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Ho Chi Minh City, we can see the two layer facade with the modern style for 50 years ago. Uh, another project is the University of Pedagogy in Hue, also share the same structure of the facade. Or in the very famous building in Ho Chi Minh City, it's a reunification palace in Ho Chi Minh City. We can see the architecture, they uh, explore the image of the bamboo tree. Even in this culture, the bamboo tree is symbolizing the gentleman 
So it's used to create a two-layer bracket for the palace. And you can see the outside and the inside, and the effects of uh, not only the, the design of the bracket, but also the sun shape. We, uh, the architecture that he created for the inside. And for the next example, bracket combined with ventilation and sun intensity adjustment at the reunification palace in Ho Chi Minh City. So we have a um, survey for the local and traditional houses and the local people, they, that they have a five IC which need to concern when they build a house. The first is the protection for sun. The second is protection for machi. The third is protection for cold. And the fourth is protection for dry. And the last is protection for flood. So we show, we compare the old and new vernacular. In the left is old vernacular. And the new is a new vernacular. You can see the uh, cursor, the if, and we can change from the local international style to the new style. And another kind, you can see the left is local, traditional, and the right is a new vernacular for the house in the south, in the Long An province in the south of Vietnam. So the architecture creates a solution to using a deep heat to reduce sunlight, reduce the heat radiation, create an open living space which covers the roof at Long An house. And for inside, we create also the same sometimes uh, like a cheap house in the uh, in the traditional uh, cities in Vietnam, like Hanoi. We have many kind of cheap houses. So in the, in the new vernacular, we also create an indoor courtyard combined with the uh, pool inside house to deliver the cooling temperature. And another kind of community house, the natural. Ventilation from outside an open courtyard with cheap heat create inside. Or another house with open living space with wood material in a villa in Ho Chi Minh City, we see the open living space it covered by a very large roof. So the temperature inside can reduce the efficient of the heat and sun outside. And for the bigger project, we can see a hotel in Ho Chi Minh City. So the balcony and the uh, terrace, we create the very thick terrace. And so we can see the a solution to deepening the outer wall layer. So we can see the atmosphere inside and the outside is very different. And another kind of uh, pillar house in the north of Vietnam, so from the old and the new. You can see the old is the house and the new is the kindergarten. So the architecture creates a familiar sense for children from open space. This floor on full to adapt to topography with cheap good happening sometimes. So the children will feel the familiar sense when he go or she go to the kindergarten. Another kind is the house in the central part of Vietnam. So natural, natural ventilation from outside to inside and this roof in, in the house. So you can see the section and the wind will float into the house. So when we take a survey and the owner of this house says that during the summer also the temperature outside is 40 or 45 percent, but inside the house very, very cool. So they almost don't need to open air con air conditioner for orange summer. So it, the the owner is very satisfied because uh, he can reduce the batches for the electricity. And another kind of question from ONU. So it's combining material forms and color in the interior to continue to convey the vernacular another kind of the school in the north. The, the hotel in the center of Vietnam, designed by Watch Media. And another kind of the cheap house, designed by Ho Kwe in Da Nang, city of Vietnam, which combine two layers of facade and skylight to adjust the house microclimate. 
and another kind of T power from O, and then you can see that the OC create many courtyards and open space inside. So for the new vernacular, the architecture also is the same, but in a new shape, new style. Like you can see the house. And as you can see the section, the architecture create two or three open space inside. Another building is a village in Vũng Tàu province. So you can see that uh, from the separate of the split, the half block split, you get the climate adaptation from natural integration. And in the right, you can see the in and out connection from private and public connection. And natural ventilation is better when we change the shape and we, we mix the block together. And for the material, you can see that the old material and we use in the new building uh, or coffee shop. Or from the very uh, the wood or bamboo, we can create a very traditional material and the new new shape of the wooding but old traditional material so last is i talk about the future of the new vernacular so you can see that today the city is very very modern and very high density so what is the opportunity or how the opportunity for vernacular can apply to the modern time. So we should think about the context that the widespread of globalization and growth based on the identification of production methods will finally lead us to culture for more generations. So vernacular experiences have been exchanged for modern technology by humans. People increasingly depend on technology, cities increasingly consume more energy. So we should answer two questions. The first is how far the limit point is growth based on the exploitation of resources. And the second is between the expected technology and vernacular experiences, which factor has better, more sustainable comparative advantages. So thinking for Vietnam, that vernacular experiences is the key to preserving identity, indigenous experiences experience have to cope with the assimilation pressures of globalization and over technology Jason. And design process must pay attention to maintain or intangible sustainability factor, not only for the building, for the tangible, but should think about the culture for the social ICs. So growth formula is measured by some of technology and resources, you can see. But if one value increase, why the other decrease? Because when we gain more technology, that means that we have to exploit more resources. So there will be no new growth or no development. So for conclusion, that I think that to preserve vernacular experiences, we are not only saving a prison for future generations, but also our responsibility for future. Keep vernacular experiences and promote it to join our current life is one of the key solutions for saving for our sustainable future. So we should think that we need to preserve vernacular experiences for future generation and the city will be more sustainable and will be more living, livable for the people. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Swan, for taking us to Vietnam, you know, virtually. And uh, I think it's a good takeaway for uh, all of us, uh, old vernacular and new vernacular. I think we should move ahead. And our last uh, speaker is from Myanmar, my dear friend, Wawa. Wawa, over to you for your presentation. Can you unmute yourself? 
Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Tusha. Can Can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. I have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Okay. Okay. Can you make it full screen? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank and congratulate Ashu Chen for organizing such a very great event. And thank you very much to Shah for inviting me to share our experience with the passive design. I myself is an um, architect and I'm very much interested in the sustainability. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, it's very interesting to learn about the other uh, panelists and speakers' presentation of the passive designs and the idea is very um, uh, motivation for me. So I learned a lot of things today as well. So for to, this is the outline of my presentation. First, I would like to present about my our ESD philosophy. How do we normally approach? Uh, our project based on environmental sustainable design, and I will touch a little bit on the passive design. The the panel, other panelists have already mentioned about the some uh, the passive design strategy. I will touch a little bit on that, and I will highlight a bit on the sustainable design strategy, and follow by the case study that we have from Myanmar. So, uh, for our EST philosophy. For most of our project, we will always uh, approach our building design evolve from the need-based approach towards the sustainability, maintainability, and also the comfort of the occupants. And after, sorry, okay. and after that, uh, in order to achieve the more comfort in terms of thermal, visual, psychological, physiological then we can apply the latest state of the art technology and of course uh, we have to design our project to be like carbon light environment to bring carbon emission to the lowest level as much as possible in terms of the material usage in terms of energy efficient system and that kind of thing so the key what's here will be like passive design strategy uh, yeah So, passive design is actually, just to recap, I'll not go into very detail about that. Passive design is a system or structure that directly uses natural energy. Uh, the uh, other speaker has also highlighted about that as well, like such as sunlight, wind, temperature difference to achieve a result without the electricity or fuel. And active design is like we, are, we have to use or produce electricity. Yeah, so there will be carbon emission, those kind of things. So this picture, the sketch is actually, I adapted from BCA Singapore. From here, you can see like overhang, corridor, vertical greenery, landscape, rooftop greenery. All those are the passive design features. And in order to achieve more comfort inside, the like fans, uh, lighting, or aircon, all those are the uh, active system. Uh, just to highlight a little bit. So just to recap, what is passive design? Passive design is totally based on climatic consideration. So if you have a different climate, your design will be totally different. Uh, we have seen a lot of best practice examples from the many speakers. So we try to attempt the, and control comfort without consuming fuel so that there will be no carbon emission. Use the orientation of the building to control heat gain and heat loss depending on the climatic data. Use the shape of the buildings to control the airflow. Use materials to control heat. Maximize use of free solar energy for heating and lighting. Free ventilation. Use shades. It can be either natural or artificial or architectural to control the heat gain. So they are also like, uh, uh, if you have a very complex building, we can also use like building performance simulation to optimize all these passive design. I'll not go into very detail about it. So when we look at the passive system, uh, which are using natural energy to bring in the comfort, we can categorize into three main categories, passive heating, passive cooling, and the daylighting. So passive heating, these are some examples, like we design, architect design the space to have like more direct solar gain or some spaces so that the people can have like 
uh, warm weather during the winter or, or for the t tropical climate like us, maybe we can make, we better make use of like ventilation strategy. We have a cross ventilation, night flashing mode, uh, that kind of things. Yeah. And for daylighting, I would like to highlight a little bit more detail because daylight penetration is a good passive strategy, but we have to bear in mind that the daylight will also accompany with the solar heat gain, which is we don't want. So when we design, architect design the building, we have to find a balance between excessive heat gain and also like sufficient daylight to be achieved. Um, sorry. Yeah, so we call cool day lighting, which is reduce the need for the electric lighting and space cooling. We can use like a proper design of exterior shading device, careful placing uh, of the window opening, and low using of high performance glazing like low transparent glass, window blinds, and paint and fabric color. Those are the uh, we can the architect or the designer can choose uh, very carefully all those uh, strategies. And this one is a little bit more on the urban planning, more than the building scape, but I would like to highlight a little bit uh, more about the importance of wind movement in the urban planning, uh, especially for hot and climate, humid climate, like uh, Yango and also like something like Jaipur, I believe. So the best method to effectively cool down the built environment is through greenery and the natural ventilation. So good wind movement will help to increase the pedestrian or the, all those working on the street will have a comfort and remove that heat build up inside the building, uh, the, the streets and all those things. And then this smoke smokes and pollutants uh, from the cars or all those will, uh, yeah, uh, will need a good wind movement. So it's important for the planner or the designer to maximize the wind movement with the planning zone. So I would like to share some tips to achieve some good wind movement. Uh, maybe this is already, uh, or most of the architects already know, but I just want to highlight a little bit only. So the governing parameter for natural, good natural performance in the urban planning will have the building block massing configuration. Instead of having a parallel configuration, it, it's good to have a staggered configuration so that the wind flow will not be blocked by one, uh, by different blocks or spacing between the building blocks uh, for if you have a large building block, if you are designing the estate uh, or some of the new town, the large building block gap, we should have like more than 10 meter. Building block orientation, in, we also have to take note of the prevailing wind direction depending on the your project location. So we have to make sure that the opening should be facing to the prevailing wind. For example, like in Singapore, the prevailing will be north and south, but in Myanmar, Yango, the prevailing will be the prevailing wind will be from the north east or south west. North east or south west, yeah. So we have to face we have to ensure that uh, the space will be okay. So block height variation, we have to play with the height variation of the uh, adjacent building. And we also have to try to create the uh, incorporated ground level while or the sky garden. So these are some of the projects that uh, we, I would like to highlight from the, from, from Myanmar. So this is a religious building, which was designed by US Design, a very uh, Yen architect, junior architect of mine, and is recently completed. So they use bamboo and also make use of the lo lo local material and also make use of the uh, orientation. And this is another project will be the private school in Yangshui. This project also use bamboo. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, school, private school project. So the, the project is located at the temperate zone. The, so it's quite cold in the winter. So they have a lot of overhang and also they have space for the, uh, to, uh, for sunlight during the winter. So even inside the building, you can see that, uh, it's well lit during the daytime without necessary to have a lighting. Uh, another project is private resident. 
Uh, because of the short of time, let me quickly run through some projects. So this is also two-story uh, architect house in in Myanmar. So they use natural material like wood, bamboos, and all those things. Yeah, and also play around with the vibes and lines. Yeah. Uh, the, another project is uh, Mingla Garden Resort, which is completed in 1996, which won the uh, ASEAN Energy Awards for the Tropical Climate in 2007. It was designed by Design 2000 Architects. Yeah, so this is in, uh, located on the 55 acre project, and at the middle there is a very big water uh, water body, and all the uh, buildings are the the located along the perimeter of the lake. So it's very cooling uh, to stay in this area. They have also like a lot of like courtyard are segregate uh, are located. Uh, another project, this is like modern, uh, which is like uh, aircon building, but which is also like a first runner up for ASEAN Energy Award and also like it is a PCA green mark go white. We can see that this is our first project in Myanmar to get green certification for the mixed use type. So this project is uh, using aircon, but we have like also make sure to reduce the cooling load by having a uh, good passive design. Uh, so this is the uh, it's about 260,000 square meter. It has like phase one and phase two. Uh, they have grade A office, retail, and the entertainment complex. So for the whole project, we are expected to have about energy saving of about 15 to 20 percent compared to Singapore Corp. Since we don't have, we are currently in Myanmar. We are currently working on the green building rating system, so we don't have our own green building rating system yet. So for this project, if they want to get the green certification, we apply Singapore green mark. So all these code, the baseline, we base on the Singapore code. So this is a completed project. Yeah. So even inside, we have the inside the mall is a five-story mall. So we have the atrium at different spots, and all the atrium will have like a like skylight. So the lighting will during the daytime, all the floor will have an, enough daylighting. Uh, so how do we achieve the energy, low energy passive design to minimize the heat gain? The first one is we play around with the uh, lawn facade facing north south orientation. So this is the north. So all these hotel, uh, office tower, the block, they are, the lawn facade is facing north south direction. And all those like toilet or the staircase, then regularly occupying space, we allocated on the east and west facade. And all the, as much as possible, we try to use the naturally ventilators. Uh, for design for staircase and all those non regularly occupied area and and the next one is like we use good performance glass some area will be low e glazing some area will be uh, normal good glazing and also incorporated the horizontal shading devices and some more uh, some of the panel we play around with the window to wall ratio to minimize the heat gain through glass facade and also we use the spandrel panel with the good insulation so that we can cut down from the solar heat gain on the, from the facet. Uh, we achieved a good envelope diameter transfer value about 44 to 47. Uh, the baseline for Singapore code is about 50 watt per meter square. So we can reduce a lot from the facet heat gain. And also like we have provision of rooftop greenery and with a swimming pool, as well as some part of the rooftop we have provision of the PV panel so that we can also cut down the heat gain through the, the roof. So any note? Uh, so some people thought that green building will be cost more. So I would like to highlight that building green doesn't necessarily need to be cost more. Uh, if, uh, if you have uh, used the passive design and then you step with this strategy in the day one, so, and some more, we can have an upfront cost, uh, often offset by the decrease in the long-term life cycle cost. For Genshin City project, they really uh, can save on the, a lot of energy it costs uh, compared to their relatively same uh, shopping mall. 
So employ first, design strategy first before considering the ethics system. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Wawa. You know, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. Thank you, Atusha. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I think uh, uh, we all had a very nice presentation from everybody. And uh, to my uh, WhatsApp and my uh, the questions, lots and lots of questions are coming. So, but I'll ask, I'll take only one question from each speaker and I, I'll appreciate if you be adhered to the time you have to answer within maximum two minutes. Okay. So now, I, now okay. my first, uh, okay. So my first question is to architect Jaina Pereira, you know. Uh, sir, just let me know, uh, am I audible, uh, Jainta? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. How do we relate sustainability of life and uh, how important it is in architecture to create sustainable buildings? You got my question? Yeah. Okay. Now, with regard to uh, how do you relate it to life, yeah. I have a very good uh, explanation to that from our great Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, there is enough in this world for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed. So that is what sustainable design or sustainable architecture or sustainable built environment is all about. With regard to the next uh, part of it, how architecture helps sustainable living or sustainable built environment. You see, as uh, I think Mr. Bhutti said, Bhutti said, architecture is the the language of all languages with regard to the environment, built environment. So if architects use architecture properly, right, with regard to sustainability, then we are contributing to the global climate issue. Now, one of the things that we need to do as architects is that make sure that our future generation is educated on sustainable architecture. So there are 17 SDG goals that have been declared by the United Nations. We need to make them taught to our future generation of architects. If architects are going to survive, that is how architects are going to survive in the future. If architects are not going to learn SDG goals, then forget about the architecture profession in the future. Somebody else is going to take over. So I have made this suggestion to many organizations that SDG, sustainable development goals, must be a compulsory module in architectural education in the future. So this has to go to all accreditation boards to make sure that if you all get your course accredited, have a compulsory module on SDG goals to be taught to our future generation. Thank you. I, I hope I, I, I give an answer to your question. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, Jaita. Thank you so very much. Uh, Mr. Bibhuti, over to you, you know. Uh, I'll really not ask the figures that by how many votes Trump has lost, you know. But my question to you will be, you know, that could, you, could you please highlight, you know, since in Nepal you have been talking a lot about your own sustainability principles, you know. So can you please highlight three passive measures design solution, you know, which makes your build form a bit sustainable. Well, God, do you, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, my prime focus in today's talk was not about physical sustainability, although that's also very important, but my prime focus was on mental and emotional sustainability, which means how a building form or its exterior appearance or whatever, how can it survive centuries of people looking at it and being attracted to it somehow and being 
you know, drawn to it and being something within their selves resonating with the building's existence. That's what mental and emotional sustainability is. You know, a building may be <coughs> very sustainable in terms of energies, energy and uh, orientation and all those physical parameters that we are taught in architectural schools, but if the building does not appeal to the viewer, it's, 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 it looks ugly and whatnot, how can it be sustainable over the centuries? In my talk, I did not <clears throat> show examples of sacred architecture at all because I wanted this to be a very secular presentation. If I had shown secular architecture, I am in sacred architecture, you could see the thousands of examples all over the world which have survived centuries. Why? Because they used, as I said, archetypes and metaphors in their architecture. Those are only two of the aspects that I concentrated on. There are many other methods that you can achieve sustainability through. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Vibhuti. Hello, uh, I, I'm audible, Neeraj Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Okay. So I think, Mr. Vibhuti, you know, today the biggest takeaway for all the audience and for all the eminent speakers is actually, you know, take the essence of mental and emotional uh, 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 outcomes through an architecture. What actually we, not, we can nutshell it, happiness through architecture. I think it's the biggest takeaway for today, uh, and I think uh, a great round of applause for Mr. Vikuti Man Singh for uh, new... Tushar, Tushar ji. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. I believe we should have a exclusive session on Bollywood with Vikuti sir. Actually, actually, actually. actually. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, Bisma, over to you. You know, uh, how far? You know, since, you know, I, I see no difference between India and Pakistan as far as our culture, our architecture, our, okay. our, our, our social living is concerned, you know. But how far uh, have the uh, sustainable studies, you know, reach in terms of present methods of energy conservation in Pakistan? Because we, in, we are also we have to about the energy conservation in the building. How far it has reached in Pakistan? Uh, Tushar, the energy conservation sustainable studies are all there. Uh, we've got them through history, through traditions, through culture, as does India. And But the thing is, at times we've all stepped away from our traditions and our culture, uh, possibly trying to ape the West. Uh, so maybe we've forgotten those. And, and in the recent past, we're coming back to those. But the thing is that with global warming and climate change, uh, even those are going to be changing uh, in current times. For example, cities like Mumbai and Karachi will be greatly impacted by 2050, um, you know, because we're all sea-facing sea cities, uh, we will be greatly impacted. So, uh, again, the sustainable studies exist. Uh, they just need to be utilized. They need to be brought forward with current times and um, while holding on to traditions and culture. Uh, but that's that's what I can say for both India and Pakistan. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Isma. Uh, Tran, you know, over to you. You took me, uh, rather every one of us, you know, without spending any single penny of dollars, you know, to Vietnam and we saw such people inside of Vietnam. We have seen that Vietnam has a rich heritage. And how far you, as a citizen, as an architect, been able to achieve in terms of sustainability? And convince your client to go very simple by using passive measures of uh, by using the passive measures for their buildings. Uh, thank you, Tusha, for your insistent question. So, as you, uh, you know, Vietnam we have many uh, thousands of years of history. So we have a rich culture, and in the fields of architecture, uh, vernacular experiences are uh, exploited and used by many architects in their design. 
It's a part of which was presented uh, by uh, me in uh, my present presentation. So we think that we have the three light three levels of exploitation of the molecular as a kind of passive design. So the, the first level is to fully exploit from the shape from material for construction techniques. So we often found in the design and uh, the architecture of the, the resort or some uh, houses in the rural area. So the, the, the layer two, the second layer is the selective of exploitation of design and material. So we can count in some urban houses, which is very common and exploited by many architects in, in Vietnam for, for this kind of layer. So the, the, the last layer is combined with technology. So it's, uh, reclaimed, it reclaims uh, uh, the money, the matches. So it's recalled the vernacular memory. It's, uh, uh, so we can find it in the design of the house inside, uh, like a uh, interior spaces or organizing some space of the house uh, to make it technology. So as an architect, I fully support and want local experiences to be exploited and used more because we know that it does not require a high budget. It's familiar and easy for using for majority of people, especially in the rural area. So architecture must be responsible for this. So for the passive design, we think that we should think about firstly thinking about the vernacular because it's very familiar and many people know about it and they can easily to apply it. As a university lecturer, I always tell my students that they need to pay attention to the culture of the past generation, not forget, because so many, now, so many new students, as young students, they, they focus too much on technology and they forgot the traditional and the vernacular. So from now on, I think that we should train the students to be conscious on these issues. So maybe in the future, we will have more many architects with through our understanding of local experiences and sustainable development so they can apply more for their design for the future. Thank you, Tushar. Thank you, Tuan. I think a good takeaway of uh, understanding between uh, the language of new vernacular which you learn from the old vernacular. I think that's it. Over to you, Baba. Uh, uh, I have seen your presentation and as in, I've been interacting with you in our last Asia Committee meeting also. I think Myanmar yeah. is very much influenced from uh, Singapore, you know, as you told me, yeah. you are following that. So till now, uh, at Myanmar level, my question to you is, has there been any much research on the passive designs, you know, within the residential and the urban planning in the Myanmar? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, good question, Tusia. Uh, okay, uh, we have the research here, and we are doing some research on the vernacular architecture of Myanmar. As you know, Myanmar is quite big, and uh, not not as big as India, but we are considerably. Uh, we have total fourteen states and divisions, so we have like different climates as well, and then we have about a uh, hundred over races, um, uh, types of tribes. So they like. I, there are a lot of researchers uh, we are doing on the uh, doing on the vernacular architecture in Myanmar, and even under AMA we have a committee called Green Architecture Committee. So I'm also part of that committee uh, together with Mio and other uh, other my colleagues. We are trying to look into more detail on this topic as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Baba. Yeah. Uh, friends, uh, I, I have lots and lots of questions, but the time does not permit me to answer oh, these questions. So finally, I think all of us have presented very nicely, you know, and I think it's a good takeaway from each present uh, from each presentation and every presentation was in its own way. So um, all the, I'll request all the presenter, all the speakers, to give the, the share their presentation. Uh, to uh, Niraji. Niraji, we can document it and, you know, we can use for our uh, further, you know, uh, documentation, all the presentation. And we can ask questions uh, from the audience. We can uh, get in touch with the, on the mail IDs of the speakers. So I think uh, first, lastly, uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, a gratitude to all of you. You have spared your time and you have given a very good presentation and all the audiences, including the students, who are actually being benefited. And we have got a lot of takeaways, you know, which we have to document it shortly. And thanks.
to everyone for making it a very successful discussion and sessions. Thank you very much. Now over to you, Gaurav, for the further proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar. Thank you, Tushar. Thank you, Tushar. Thank you, Tushar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I think we have. Shaji, yes. I I must say that uh, this session was really a very wow wow session. <laughs> wow wow. Do you know that uh, it's a Hindi word and it's like wonderful if you translate it. So uh, I would request our president, uh, Mr. Pankaj Bhakar, to uh, please deliver this token of love and gratitude to all our speakers. Uh, this uh, uh, this e memento has been designed by Vivekanand Building Science Center, which is uh, uh, in Vivekanand Global University. Uh, this institute is our academic partner for all the student related activities. Pankaj Bhakar, sir. I would request you to please present these e mementos uh, to all of our speakers and moderator of the session. Tech team, can we have the first memento? Thank you, Jayanta Pareraji, for um, sparing your valuable time. We had a wonderful session from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm honored to be a speaker here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next slide. Thank you, architect uh, Vibhuti Mansingji, for excellent presentation. And you were always uh, smiling and very heartening to see at this age a uh, spirited man like you. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, architect uh, Bhishma Sami. Um, you made our day valuable. Today was a great learning from an eminent architect from Pakistan, and we are looking forward for similar sessions in future. Thank you so much, Vishman. Thank you so much, Pankaj Saab, and thank you so much, Asacham. Thank you, architect Nirgan Poon Saab. Uh, thank you so much for making making it all the way from Vietnam. I have done my some uh, memorable work in Vietnam in Singapore Tech City, so. I'll come back to you sometime physically, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, architect Wagwaf, too, from Mena. I think uh, it was very pleasing to see your beautiful presentation and very mesmerizing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what words I can express my uh, gratitude to you, Shanji. I think you have been always at your best, and this was one of the, those days where we really are delighted. For with your leadership, with your vision, with your teamwork, I think you made this afternoon absolutely fascinating for all of us. Thank you so much, Shanji. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pankaj. Thank you, you are you are very your certificate. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. wanted to thank Gaurav, you know. I just catch hold of Gaurav in last moment because he was busy with some assignment. I said you have to do uh, this master of ceremony actually. He as usual or you know, very kindly say yes, I'm okay with it. Thank you very much, Gaurav, for this. And kindly Gaurav uh, ensure that we mail all the certificates to all the Sure. Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And, yeah. and, and, and we should carry that whenever we meet them physically. Yes, yeah. yes. I will when we will come, when we will have physical meetings, and at that time we will definitely give them physical certificates also. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Neither take care of this, we must keep them aside. All the speakers yeah. with whom we are interacting, I'm sure one day we will be meeting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pankaj sir, and thank you, Captain Tushar. Uh, I, I'll just take two more minutes of you just to introduce uh, Mr. Sudhir Mathur to all of you. He has a vast experience of 30 years in, in, uh, in this field of uh, MEP consultation. He has been associated with uh, many large commercial and residential hotels, heritage projects. And uh, presently, uh, he is serving as Secretary, Associate Bison uh, Chapter. And he has been uh, First president and chairman of almost all the committees like ASHRAE, ISHRAE, FSAI, Indian Plumbing Association. 
So I request Sudhirji to wrap up this session by giving vote of thanks. Over to you, Sudhirji. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gauravji. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, sustainable architecture by passive means uh, this, is be, this has been a dear topic to us all because we are MEP designers. Uh, we love to see the buildings and I know that uh, architecture, many people say that architecture is a frozen music. And uh, I would like to thank for this uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Vibhuti Singh Sahab, who has uh, taken us to a next level of architecture, where you know he is talking about uh, you know the, uh, the 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 emotional architecture. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Jayanta Pereira, who showed us beautiful uh, passive designs of Sri Lanka and the way he is practicing sustainability and sustainable architecture in Sri Lanka and other part of the world is amazing. I would also like to thank uh, Ma'am Bishma uh, uh, Sami from Pakistan, a beautiful design she showed of various parts of Pakistan where sustainability is showing its uh, glory. I would say it's a glory of sustainability and passive means are really uh, you know, making us a lot of sense in, in, in this particular world. So thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Tuan from Vietnam, who has shown the uh, vernacular architecture of Vietnam, where there are a lot of trees and a lot of plants around. The way, the way, way these, uh, you know, buildings are uh, breathing and they are showing that, yeah, yes, passive architecture is the life uh, of the uh, buildings. I would also like to thank uh, Ma'am uh, Vava for, from uh, Myanmar. She has shown a lot of projects, a lot of pictures of uh, Myanmar architecture. Yes, uh, we understand that uh, you know technology has played a major role in uh, in building architecture. But as you mentioned, which uh, all these countries are following are really impressive, and they, are, they will take us to the next level. So I would like to thank Tusharji who gracefully showed the architecture of our country, especially Rajasthan, which is a you know which is a hot climate. Uh, with, uh, some part is hot and uh, humid climate also, where the, uh, the, uh, the the vernacular architecture or the passive means are really showing way to new architect students. Uh, and it was a buzzword in this whole uh, session that. Uh, Vernacular architecture, old architecture should, you know, merge, uh, and the new architecture should learn from the vernacular architecture and create a fusion out of uh, the, uh, the these things. So, not taking much of the time, I would like to thank uh, the sponsors. I would like to thank uh, the uh, Asochem uh, Jam, uh, you know, team uh, headed by Neeraji, Amitji, and uh, other people. So with that, uh, I would uh, say, uh, stay safe, stay home, and uh, enjoy the beauty of passive architecture. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Sudhirji. Last word uh, from my side, a special gratitude to uh, Neeraj Arora and his team, who always sits on the backstage, you know, and do everything. And so, Neerajji, thank you to you and your team for providing us and giving us this platform. Thank you so very thank much. You, sir. Thank you. 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 Please close the program. Thank you.